In 10th place, we have How to Cure Hair Loss. So while technically this is a top 10 list, I might be cheating that a little bit today. When I was doing my research, I came across so many different ways throughout history of attempting to cure hair loss that I knew I just had to share them with y'all. So there was no way I was gonna limit myself. Let's start off with uh, 50 BCE Rome. So Romans who experienced hair loss tended to rum myrrh into their scalps, which sounds simple enough until you learn that other Romans tried a more drastic remedy, which involved burning a donkey's genitals to ash, which was then mixed with the urine of the person losing their hair and applying that mixture to the head. Moving on to Egypt. Donkey hooves, dates, and dog paws would be ground together, mixed with oil, cooked, and rubbed on bald heads as an ancient remedy for hair growth. A medical script known as the Ebers Papyrus offers a different recipe for Egyptian hair loss, mixing fat from a hippopotamus, crocodile, male cat, snake, and ibex, which is then applied to the scalp. If that doesn't work, the follow-up solution is to boil porcupine hair and apply it to the bald areas for four days. Finally, in ancient Greece, if women were going bald, they sometimes used a hair mask consisting of a mix of feces, urine, and menstrual scarletness. Okay. Hippocrates endorsed a mix of pigeon droppings, opium, horseradish, beetroot, and spices as an ancient remedy for hair growth, while Aristotle recommended goat urine as a treatment instead. Um, I'll pass on all fronts, thanks. In ninth place, we have separating lashes with a safety pin. This is probably the most modern trick on today's list, and it comes courtesy of film star Audrey Hepburn. She liked to darken, plump, and lengthen her lashes like the best of them, and she had one trick to ensure that her lashes looked naturally fanned out and clump free, and it wasn't, you know, some sort of magic mascara wand. After applying a layer of mascara, her makeup artist, Alberto De Rossi, would take a pin and meticulously separate every single lash. Just for a fun little reference, the upper eyelid alone has an average of roughly 70 to 150 lashes, making that undertaking quite the long and possibly, you know, dangerous process. To prepare for the undertaking, it's recommended to curl your lashes first to make things easier. One must start at the base near the waterline and pull the pin through to the top, separating, yep, each individual lash. So this defines each lash as well as helps to distribute the dark mascara pigment more evenly. Once you complete the first eye, repeat on the next and then proceed to your lower lid lashes if, you know, if you'd like. I'll stick with an overall like lash brush, thanks, and like my reliable false lashes. That's good enough for me. As much as it hurts to yank out the occasional lash from lash glue or liquid latex, at least I'm not risking, you know, stabbing my eye. Trust me, I'm a heck of a klutz. In eighth place, we have geisha beauty. So during the Heian era, geishas would blacken their teeth using a mixture of oxidized iron fillings steeped in an acidic solution. One of the main reasons for this practice was the fact that for hundreds of years, pitch black objects were regarded as immensely pretty. And unlike the Western ideals that folks like myself have been raised with, that's just how things were there. The women used to remove their heavy makeup with a nightingale poop, which apparently did wonders for their skin. The active chemical in the bird poop is guanine, which allegedly cleanses the skin and rejuvenates it. Now, geishas aside, Back in the day, the beauty of Japanese women was often judged on the basis of their hair length, and the ideal length was considered two feet below their waist. I don't want to think about how long it would take to brush hair that long, never mind the hairballs that would form. Or mats. Nah. In seventh place, we have the use of copper. So copper apparently has many benefits for the skin, one of which is that it can help to heal wounds and scars, along with having anti-aging properties. Ancient Egyptians used a lot of copper for their skin. And according to modern dermatologists, copper peptides are well known in the skincare world. So apparently I've been hiding under some sort of rock. They improve skin, including firmness, smoothness and reduction of fine lines and wrinkles by promoting collagen, elastin, and improved antioxidant activity. Just a little note though, too much copper intake can make you nauseous and give you gastrointestinal issues or, you know, cause serious organ system toxicity. Good news, I'm not gonna freak out my gold-loving dad today by replacing silver with copper as my favorite metal. Honest to goodness, even just choosing to have fake silver ornaments on my Christmas tree over gold last year almost started a full-blown argument in Canadian Tire. It was the whole thing. In sixth place, we have Egyptian makeup. Look. Everyone knows about ancient Egyptian using coal around their eyes to shield against the sun, deter flies, and overall just look stunning. Personally, I very much still appreciate the practice, along with my collection of eyeliner pens. I currently have like four black ones on the go for reasons. If you don't believe me, here are the two I have on me that I used to touch up this makeup with before I started talking today. But what you might not have known was that crocodile dung mixed with donkey's milk was used by Cleopatra as a face mask. She also famously bathed in milk with rose petals for hours, which like, honestly, goals. Cheeks were blushed up using a mixture of clay and crushed beetles, which was something also done later on by Queen Elizabeth I to get her memorable red lips. One of the most popular cosmetic ingredients in ancient Greece was olive oil. According to legend, a Greek cook named Calamus invented soap by mixing olive oil 
with wood ash from Mount Sapo, so it could be used for cleaning utensils at sacrifices. However, when he washed his hands with this mixture, his skin became soft and smooth. It was clear that olive oil had cleansing and beautifying properties. So you're telling me that my big fat Greek wedding lied to me about Greeks using Windex for everything? Curse you, Hollywood. In fifth place, we have a dimple machine. In the 1930s, dimples were considered to be one of the most beautiful accessories any gal could have, leading to Isabel Gilbert inventing the dimple machine in 1936, which promised to give you dimples. This contraption, also referred to as the dimpler, consisted of a chin strap that held two soft rubber dimple indenters in place, one on each cheek. The strap had a coil that created pressure and was described as very uncomfortable and uh, the dimples left your face within a few hours anyways. Jeepers, I guess a lot of folks really wanted to look like Shirley Temple. Which is fair, she was pretty adorable. I feel like nowadays, thanks to the interwebs, we have a lot more folks that we can decide that we want to look like. Personally, I'm a mix of wanting to look like my celebrity crush and a brat doll. Or a Barbie, depending on the day. In fourth place, we have hair secrets. Alrighty, Let's spin the wheel to see where we're starting with this one. Ah, Greece. Alrighty, to achieve blonde hair, which was highly coveted, women would drench their hair in vinegar to bleach it, which would lead to, you know, hair loss and thus the popularity of wigs. Something I didn't know before today was that in ancient Egypt, only women from higher classes were allowed to have long hair, and slave women had to cut their hair very short, and the hair cut off was often used for making headpieces for the aristocrats. Before hairspray was invented, women used to use lard to keep their huge wigs in place. There were many times when rats jumped on women's wigs from the smell of the lard. Okay, that's a big no for me. Sure, I attract the occasional flies with the amount of hairspray that I wear when I curl my hair, but that's plenty. Modern sidebar. During the World War II days, women had to make deal without wax and used sandpaper to remove unwanted body hair. Yeah, I'm shuddering. In third place, we have Roman makeup. So the Romans attributed great power to cosmetics. Cosmetics first used in ancient Rome for ritual purposes were just part of daily life. Some fashionable cosmetics, such as those imported from Germany, Gaul, and China, were so expensive that the Lex Opia tried to limit their use in around 189 BCE. These designer brands spawned cheap knockoffs that were sold to poorer women. Working class women could afford the cheaper varieties, but may not have had the time to apply the makeup, as the use of makeup was a time consuming affair because cosmetics needed to be reapplied several times a day due to weather conditions and poor composition. Cosmetics were applied in private, usually in a small room where men did not enter. Cosmete, female slaves that adorned their mistresses, were especially praised for their skills. They would beautify their mistresses with the cultus, the Latin word encompassing makeup, perfume, and jewelry. Scent was also also an important factor of beauty. Women who smelled good were presumed to be healthy. Due to the stench of many of the ingredients used in cosmetics at the time, women often drenched themselves in copious amounts of perfume. Romans believed that the smoke from the burning ambergris would make women more attractive. Ergo, ambergris was typically used in face powders for this reason. Another trick involved sitting over straw fires to make hair shine, or sleeping in a vase filled with red chicken fluid to make it thicker. If that wasn't gross enough, urine was included in facial masks that women used to look clean and beautiful. They also used urine to whiten their teeth as well. Mm. Hard pass. In second place, we have the uses of baths. Nowadays, I know I personally love a good bath to relax, you know, aching muscles or just decompress. But history wasn't always that way. Vapor baths have been described as similar to a modern day sauna, with unknown vapors that claim to cure all kinds of ailments. Sadly, the Victorian era bath ended up burning more people than actually curing them. Next up, we have the crocodile feces bath. The Greeks and Romans apparently found the best way to fight wrinkles and lines was by collecting the feces of the crocodile and having a bath in it. Apparently it reduced aging to quite an extent. I'll uh, stick with my Epsom salts and uh, lush bath bombs. Thanks! In first place, we have methods of obtaining pale skin. I'm very grateful that my snow white complexion is quite natural, thanks to my German Irish mutt heritage, but for those who wanted it, here are some ways not to do it. Going back to using olive oil for everything, apparently if you combine it with white lead, it can be used to lighten the skin tone. Although this made people's faces visibly lighter, the women who did this were also subjected to death by slow lead poisoning, which was, you know, absorbed into their skin. Lead used to be used for a lot of makeup, and while it was efficient, it was also pretty dang deadly. Speaking of deadly, around the 6th century, aristocratic woman, in a haste to develop that pale, death-like pallor, which was very famous in those times, used to drain their bodies of all their red fluid, one drop at a time. Well then, that explains why everyone was so weak and tired all the time. But geez, don't waste that elixir, make sure you're donating it to your friendly neighborhood vampires. A common way to remove freckles and tans, and achieve that flawless pale complexion, was by using lemon juice mixed with sugar and borax on the face in the 1890s. And once again, for that eternal facial glow and skin bleaching, more modern women would wear a 
face mask taped to their faces while they slept. I would never be able to sleep if I tried that. In less lethal practices, those geisha women I mentioned before used rice flour powder based paste as a foundation. Hey, now that's something I feel like I could try and not risk my health with. Can you offer a list at number 10? Ancient Egyptian eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star? They look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So in order to avoid that mess, ancient Egyptians first had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. You're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days. Perfect. We'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day in high school, I had to use Dippity Do Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side. I always got the five out of six hold. That was good. Six was too much. Nobody ever did the full six. That's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling, spiking glue, and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls, I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Catch it today, we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray, that's awesome. DJ Polly. psst. No. Number eight, coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the Dead Sea was one of the most popular popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that, rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bath probably can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party earlier to go have a bath. Swear to God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold, I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath, do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Was like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know. They would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or burn or anything like that. You don't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone atop of your head. Easy. Back in 2019, experts found archeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. It's like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. A nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five, fake beards. I can't 
and grow a beard. So maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one, you know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total. But during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this bearded pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with a, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so. Again, creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya, now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news. I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah. Oh, you have acne? Hmm. Are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that. Come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne. Maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts, and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like, the pyramids? I couldn't tell you. Could you? Didn't think so. Hit that thumbs up. We're both wrong. We're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating. Imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her person. While this of course is a wonderful cosmetic replacement and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, had significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further. And they did. So they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe. And in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals, and walking in them would have been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it's clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list. I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful. Why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? Is this permanent? While on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful. Ancient Egyptians' use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their hair and fingernails and shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna, that's kinda nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you wanna get henna. It's important to know, that guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the Old Spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of deodorant like underarm deodorant. It was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts. Mix them all together and bam, there you go. You're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in in your underarm right there. Right there on your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever have that happen? Turns to feta cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. It smells great, but not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. Who knows? Kicking off the list at number 10, eyelash extensions. Ugh, right off the hop. Here we go. Nowadays, beauty products are safer. They're made in a cleaner way. We're going the right direction when it comes to putting things on or around our eyes. You know, thank God. But back in the late 1800s, we weren't quite there yet. No, not even close. This right here is an ad from the Independent Journal back from 1899. And it says, if your eyes are unattractive, you may make them irresistible by transplanting the hair. 
just the hair. Transplanted eyelashes and eyebrows are the latest things in the way of personal adornment. An ordinary fine needle is threaded with a long hair, generally taken from the head of the person to be operated upon. Doink! Oh, let's do a little gray, why not? <laughs> yeah, they would use a white illicit substance that's illegal that I can't say on YouTube. They would rub that around your eyes just to numb the eyelids. How stupid is that? The doctor would thread the doctor would then thread your hair through the lids and then cut them down so they're even. Yeah, I thought peeling an eyelash off at the end of the night was bad. I would see that a lot, one of those. This is way worse. Never doing this. Number nine, Doramad toothpaste. Doramad. Are you mad? That should have been the slogan. Are you mad? The worst toothpaste to ever exist. Doramad, yeah, that was the one. Back in the 40s, people were brushing their teeth with radiation. Yeah, even on the actual tube, it says its radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Mmm, I can feel it working already. I'm gonna throw up. Doctors hate this one trick. Here we go. The tube continues to, well, lie to its users, saying the radioactive cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is then hindered in their destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant and mild, refreshing taste. Awesome. Yeah, I broke both my front teeth in half when I was younger. If only I had Doramad. I would have just bounced off the pavement and then just kept running. I would have had invincible teeth. Yeah, this toothpaste did not work and it did not stick around. It was horrible for humans. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but like, its radioactivity was low. I can't even say that. Imagine this coming out now, no way. And just remember, good gums don't bleed, they glow. Doormat. Number eight, radioactive water. Yeah, you thought Dasani water was bad? Okay, just wait, buckle up. Back in 1932, Eben Byers, a 41-year-old steel manufacturer and golf pro, <laughs> hey -o, met his fate in a horrible way. In a constant battle with arm pain and fatigue, Byers was told to drink radioactive water by his physiotherapist. And he was like, okay, you bet. Physiotherapist, anything you say, doctor. He said that drinking this product would help with the golfer's arm pain and fatigue. Magically, okay. Each of these bottles contained one microgram of radium and one microgram of esthorium. Yeah, the guy would drink radiation after every meal and subsequently lost weight, but sadly, he also developed bone necrosis in his jaw. Yeah, Dasani doesn't sound too bad now, does it? Number seven, Thoradia. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest compliment. Now, it's got a little Edward Cullen vampire vibes. L little different now, but still nice. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, powders, lipsticks, ah, uh, anything to get your glowy glam on, they made. And they made it in a horrible way. They made thorium and radium lead products to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles. How insane does that sound coming out of my mouth? Look at cosmetic companies now. Imagine Thoradia just dropping on shelves casually. The product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, France, you name it, it was all over the world. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these horrible side effects, thank God, and then they pulled it from shelves. Imagine seeing a friend and they're literally glowing, vampire for sure, or radiation. Number six, the trico system. I was talking about plucking my uh, unibrow the other day. I was really going in on that, so. We had to throw this one in. Instead of plucking your eyebrows in the late 1920s, you would ideally want to use the trico system to remove any, you know, unwanted hair. This device was booming back in the 20s. Hair salons had to have this system. And come 1925, there were over 75 trico systems installed in beauty shops all around. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a small window for a few minutes, and boom, just like that, hair gone. Yeah, just 20 quick visits to your local trico system and then boom, then your hair is magically gone. Just 20 visits, easy. You have the time of the day, right? Their trick here was x-ray technology directly on their face. Not a, not a bright idea. So four years later in 1929, trico system side effects were so well known, you know, being ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death. This was not the solution you wanted. So again, pulled from stores. Number five, Gorad's cream. Gorad's Oriental Cream hit the market back in 1936. This cream was supposed to, you know, freshen up your skin, make you look lighter, younger, tighter, whatever Paul Rudd's doing. But instead, this skin cream had one user ending up in a book that's very, you know, Chamber of Horror styles. Just what not to do in terms of cosmetics and bad stuff. This magic ingredient was meant to magically make you beautiful, and it had some magic mercury inside the product, it was horrible. Not something you want on your face ever. Mercury, no fun, I don't recommend. 
Zero out of five, my friend. The results were haunting. This woman had soon developed black gums, her teeth loosened, and dark rings appeared around her eyes. It was haunting. It's called mercury poisoning, and it's not fun. Number four, fluoroscope. A proper measurement of the foot is the first step to a healthier lifestyle. If you're off by half a size in either width or length, you're setting yourself up for future problems. So when x-rays started being used to properly measure up family foot sizes in shoe stores, well, it sounded like an ideal start to an otherwise exhausting process. I worked in a shoe store while I was in school, so I get it, you know? The amount of stinky feet I've had to measure up with that metal, cold, really cold metal thing, no thank you. Gross. So in comes this new fluoroscope technology, right? Measure your feet, but make it cool, make it futuristic, right? Make it technological. This began in the 1920s. Everybody used these things, it was completely normal, and by the time the 40s rolled around, scientists were now concerned about the radiation level emitting off these machines, and eventually they too were banned. They're also really intimidating to look at. There's a speedometer on it, like for some reason. It doesn't look like an easy thing. It's, uh, it looks scary. It looks like a saw trap, you know what I mean? Number three. Thallium. In the late 19th century, something called thallium acetate started to sweep the nation. It was a hair removal method, but originally thallium was prescribed for those who suffered with ringworm. Just in case you got both, here you go. So yeah, now we're getting a little concerned historically. Even so, thallium didn't do anything about said ringworm. That in itself was already a failed product. It made patients' hair fall off, so the ringworm was easier to find. Doesn't actually help the issue, just makes it easier to find, I guess. So I guess that's helpful, I don't know, it's still bad. Eventually, thallium was sold by itself as a cream. It's very toxic, it should never touch your skin. This was once rat poison, historically, and then humans were then rubbing it around on their heads, casually. And that, that's insane. This was outlawed in the 30s, thankfully, but the fact that this was ever sold in history just baffles me, this whole list baffles me. Number two. Aqua Tofana, I love this one. Going back to the 1600s for this one. If you're a murderino, you know this one already. It's a good one. Aqua Tofana was a cosmetic that was sold to women back in the early 1600s. It was a cosmetic that also doubled down as a poison. Yeah, some naughty stuff going on here. The origins of said deadly cosmetic that was sold and you know, responsible for around 600 deaths is pretty wild. Back in 1632, two women, Francesca Lasarda and Tatiana D'Amato, they both created this poison so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned from the cream that they put on, right? This was a time where women were treated horribly, right? Like even worse than now, you know what I mean? Like. I was gonna say a time where women had less rights, but I'm like, eh, we're actually getting worse historically, so who knows? But eventually, Tiafana was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe, her recipe lived on. Her recipe carried on through her daughter, Yulia Tiafana. She took this deadly recipe to Rome and kept manufacturing it. Pretty badass, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, obviously it's horrible in so many ways, but I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty smart, I think. Like if she was a villain in a Sherlock Holmes movie, we'd love her, know what I mean? Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. And finally, number one, Vita Radium Suppositories. Hey, my favorite one historically, this is great. With guaranteed real radium, there we go, just in case you got that fake stuff, this is the real good stuff. The home products company of Denver, Colorado came out with these suppositories, you know, back in 1930. And the way that they marketed these things is so funny and I have to end the list on it. It's one of my favorites ever. The company reaches out and says, weak discouraged men. If you are showing signs of slowing up in your actions and duties, perhaps if you have begun to lose your charm, your personality, your normal manly attitude, then certainly you want to stage a comeback. The man who has lost these precious attributes of youth knows how to appreciate their value. He realizes that happiness depends on his ability to perform the duties of a real man. Sweet glorious pleasures of life, nature intended that you should enjoy them. Now is the time to act. And then these real men put radiated suppositories up their real How funny is that? They're like, are you a man? Yeah. Do you want to get back to business? Yeah. All right. Bend over. It's so stupid. This is so dangerous also, obviously, but like, it's so funny that they're so aggressive with this ad. Huh. The initial goal here was to, of course, feel better and, you know, feel like a real manly man again. 
but instead of waking up feeling refreshed, users eventually stopped waking up altogether. All right, so let's start off with Venetian Ceruse. It's easy to recognize even if the name isn't. It's that thick white lead powder biddies used to whack on their face cement thick, something they've been doing since ancient Roman times. Queen Elizabeth I was known for her iconic white makeup. The Venetian Ceruse made up of white lead and vinegar and applied to achieve a pale, smooth complexion that signified wealth. The beauty ideals at the time included bright Bright, wide set eyes, snow white skin, rosy cheeks and lips, and fair hair. Elizabeth I was known to use ceruse to hide her smallpox scars, and ceruse became so commonly used by many fashionable aristocratic women during the era. Yet the toxic effects of lead absorbed into the skin didn't go unnoticed in that time either. And it's hard to when your skin becomes grayish and shriveled, and your face hair falls out, and your teeth start eroding away. Not subtle. So because the makeup ate at the skin, the skin needed to be hidden more with more makeup. In addition to ceruse, the beauty regime also included a face wash with eggshells, alum, mercury, and honey. The mercury also eating away at the skin, and the eggshells causing micro abrasions to make that all the easier. In the 1700s, a famous beauty and aristocrat from Ireland died from lead poisoning due to her use of ceruse, or what was called death by vanity, Maria Coventry, Countess of Coventry. Its name is beautiful and has the same cloying sweetness and smell as its poison, Belladonna, aka Dudley Nightshade. This is the patron flower of one of my closest friends, so girl, this is for you. According to the Big Bad Book of Botany, the world's most fascinating flora by Michael Largo, a trop of Belladonna's poisonous extracts were historically used by assassins to kill their targets and by women to dilate their pupils to look more seductive. The roots are the most potent part of the plant, but even one leaf can be fatal when ingested or exposed to. Yet Italian women who called it Belladonna used deadly nightshade as an eye drop to dilate their pupils, which supposedly made them more attractive, or at least made them look like an anime character. Naturally, some poison in your eyeball can cause visual distortion and sensitivity to light, and if taken systematically, can kill you pretty quickly. In the mood for a snack, how about some toxic dust pressurized into a cracker? Our snack wafers. It's exactly what they were too, so if you didn't pop into your mouth whole, that thing would have the crumbling power of a Nature Valley granola bar. Sold under the brand name Dr. James P. Campbell's Safe Arsenic Wafers, the fact you put the word safe in there, you know, dicey. In the United States and Europe, these were little white chalk wafers that could treat a variety of complexion problems such as skin tags, moles, freckles, pimples, blemishes, and also advertised to cause pale skin which was oh so classy. In fact, the consumptive chic aka dying from deadly disease chic became an ideal beauty standard during the Victorian era as victims of tuberculosis would become sickly pale and thin. Rich people saw that on the street and said, oh, I think I might steal that look. However, the way that arsenic worked was by destroying red blood cells, and thanks to the toxicity of arsenic, it could also cause symptoms like damage to the kidneys and nervous system, hair loss, and skin lesions called arsenic keratosis. The wafers were marketed as being safe, naturally, and while tolerance to arsenic can be built up in small amounts, arsenic is one of the most toxic substances with a median lethal dose of 13 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. To build an immunity would take scientific precision, not snacking on poison crackers you fish out of your purse. Does the sentence dysfunctional hair removing cream raise alarms in you? Because it does in me, and apparently the FDA, it's Kremlu. Advertised as perfectly safe and somehow permanent way to remove hair, this cream actually poisoned the user instead, like everything else on this list. And while women mostly applied it to the upper lip, the problem showed up literally everywhere on the body, according to historian Gwen Clay. Now, women lost their hair all over their bodies, as well as suffering paralysis and even damage to their eyes, she written. So, one of Kremlu's active ingredients was thallium acetate. Thallium was also used as rat poison and has since been banned in the US due to how toxic it is to even people and animals exposed accidentally. Kremlu didn't stay on the market, but it was no thanks to the FDA. The Journal of American Medical Association, which in 1932 described the product as a viciously dangerous depilatory, led to the diagnostic fight against Kremlu by publishing a series of articles about its effects. Women who suffered side effects of the popular product sued the company, forcing it into bankruptcy in 1932 after winning more than 2.5 million in damages. But the FDA, when consulted, could only referred to the JAMA's work and Kremlu didn't qualify as a drug and the agency didn't have power to regulate cosmetics yet at the time. Nothing like a beautifier that makes you into a terrifier. Gurad's oriental 
cream. Bonus points for that dicey name. All right, so it's the 1920s, and there's a popular beauty cream called Rods. And it's been on the market for decades, regardless of the horror stories you'd hear endlessly about it from all your girls. It constantly caused mercury poisoning from the calomel compound in it, which was no picnic to go through. Then, party on, you would develop dark rings around your eyes and neck, get bluish black gums that were jiggly like jelly, and lose teeth before dying from organ failure. The women could wear the cream once or twice without ill effects. Over time, that definitely changed. But as mentioned, it was one of the products that just stayed on the shelves. The cream was available for decades, but the FDA started to regulate cosmetics in 1938 thanks to the Roosevelt's at the House of Horrors event. Calomel was no longer allowed, which means I'll never experience a magic of a mercury-filled makeup or figure out what the color Rachel cream was supposed to be for this brand. Become skinny by inviting a parasitic man-eating worm into your body? It's the tapeworm diet. And since this is still around today despite being illegal, I want to take a moment and say your body is genuinely beautiful and there are thousands of other options before this choice. So the idea is simple and gross. You take a pill containing a tapeworm egg and once attached, the parasite grows inside of the host, ingesting part of whatever the host eats. In theory, this enables the dieter to simultaneously lose weight and eat without worrying about calorie intake. Uh, wrong. Tapeworms take hold in various parts of the body and also grow large in size, resulting in blockage in organs and potentially even death. So it's not like it's just vibing out in your stomach forever unnecessarily. Having started in the 1900s, this trend was the result of the whole 16 inch waist BS that made women break their bodies with corsets. This was an era of beauty equaling sacrifice, and sacrifices were most certainly made once the desired weight was achieved. To get rid of the now unnecessary parasite, dieters would employ the same methods as those unwillingly afflicted by the worms. In Victorian England, this included pills or special devices. One such invention, created by Dr. Myers Shelfield, attempted to lure the tapeworm by inserting a cylinder of food up the digestive tract. It comes as no surprise that many patients choked to death before the tapeworm was ever successfully removed. Some people still attempt this diet. In 2013, Today Magazine reported a woman in Iowa bought a tapeworm online, swallowed it, and then had to go to a doctor for help. This trend wouldn't exist if society could get its crap together, which is skin bleaching. The issue of colorism and favoritism towards lighter skin has created a decimating global empire today worth more than $8 billion, profiting off of discrimination in today's beauty standards, and predicted to be $12.7 billion on the black market by 2027. This is made painfully obvious by literally every beauty trend we've discussed so far, and that we've covered in every video about beauty. Their goals are to be pale, pale, pale since the time of the Biazetines. In a study published in 2009, it was found lighter skinned black applicants reviewed more educated and had better work experience. And then in another famous study in 2011, it found darker skinned black women received harsher prison sentences than lighter skinned black women for the same crimes. So for many people, having lighter skin can mean the difference, how people treat them, see them, respect them. So as a result, we live in a world where beauty standards are often appropriated from people of color, whitewashed, regurgitated, only to be praised and adored then when previously laughed at and bullied. It tells someone that they're not beautiful unless they're pale. So as a result, skin bleaching creams, pills, injections, and other products come out and they contain hydroquinonines, with that work to reduce the amount of melanin in the skin by disrupting the melanin production. This can increase the risk of skin cancer, as melanin forms as a function to protect skin and eyes from UV rays. Chemical burns, infections, eczema, herpes, and other conditions also arrive. People have had skin blister off. And then the black market skin bleaches, which is a, the largest industry, mercury is an active ingredient which can cause mercury poisoning, leading to damage to skin, liver, kidneys, and the nervous system. So this is a super deadly product. Prepared to be baffled by eyelash extensions. How could they ever be illegal or dangerous? I'm willing to get I'm willing to bet guess that brains jump to glues or maybe the lashes, but banned being made of something poisonous. Wrong and wrong. Be ready to yak, this one's rough. So tales of eyelash extensions in Britain seem to have been spawned by an 1882 news snippet by Henry LaBush in the Truth, which is referred to as the popularity of this procedure amongst Parisian beauties. Here is some of the snippet for you from the Dundee Courier, July 6, 1899, that describes the procedure. Be ready to fast forward if you're the queasy type. So, if your eyes are unattractive, you may make them irresistible by transplanting hair. Sounds alright. There are specialists 
to make a handsome living out of the process of transplanting hair from the head to the eyebrows or the eyelash. Let me jump ahead to the through the Shakespeare talk here. Ah, okay. An ordinary fine needle is threaded with a long hair genuinely taken from the head of the person being operated on. The lower border of the eyelid is then thoroughly cleaned and in order for the process to be as painless as possible, rubbed with a solution of cocoa, not the hot chocolate one, the white one. The operator then, by a few skillful touches, runs his needle through the extreme edges of the eyelid, in and out along the edge of the eye, leaving hair threads in loops of carefully graduated length. Most of the hairs have been transplanted, planted, take root and grow, but a few fall out. I've hated every second of that, so let's just move on. Yeah, psych guys, I'm gonna actually talk about more eye getting poked. So this is Lashler, a new and improved lash dye that would stop you from putting mascara on every day. Take my money. First manufactured in 1933, it was a beauty salon exclusive and bragged of it leaving you with a radiant personality. The first adverse after effect was reported literally July that year. Severe dermatitis of the eyelids surrounding the skin and edema that almost began immediately after dyeing the eyelashes with the Lashler product. Complete relief only occurred after they removed all her eyelashes. Four months later, four new cases of adverse side effects with Lashler that included vesicular eruption and marked edema, as well as carotia. Okay, never mind, big words, you guys. Their eyes were essentially bubbling and melting. It takes a year for the first fatality. A 52 year old woman who made the mistake of plucking her eyebrows before dyeing them. Within hours, her eyes swelled shut, then her fever went to 104, and after eight days of agony and eyeball ulcers and decay, she died. Not only was there a rash, yes, pun intended, of side effects from Lashler in 1933, but Franklin Roosevelt became president, and Roosevelt had a major goal to better public health. And in 1933, Chicago Fair set, he put up the House of Horrors, showing befores and afters of unregulated products effect on people. One was a woman before and after being blinded by Lashler. Still, it wasn't until 1938 that the federal FDCA passed, which finally regulated cosmetics. The first product seized under the new law was Lashler, which was alleged to have been adulterated with poisonous or delirious substances, a coal tar preparation, and a bunch of other big scary terms. Last but not least though is Radium Girls. When radium was discovered and successfully used as a cancer treatment, people made the mistake of seeing it as an all powerful health tonic, a taken essentially like a probiotic. It became an additive in a number of everyday products from toothpaste to cosmetics and even food and drinks. One such preparation called Radithor was simply distilled water with tiny amounts of the substance substance dissolved in it. You could just buy it in cases, you know, like go to Costco, that type of thing. Then came the tacky 1920s fads, and one was glow in the dark water. The dials were covered in a special luminous paint, shone all the time, and didn't require charging in sunlight. It looked like magic. One of the first factories to produce these watches opened in New Jersey in 1916. It hired about 70 women, the Radium Girls, the first of thousands to be employed in many such factories in the United States. It was a well-paid, glamorous job, and since it was the most expensive substance in the world, and a wonder drug, medium girls believed they were getting healthier as they worked, especially because they were told to lick the paintbrushes to point them. What an honor. Then came the symptoms, the toothaches, the fatigue, the nausea, the loss of taste, the infertility. Then came the first death, Molly Magia, 22, who died after years of agony and her doctor removing what was left of her jaw. Radium girls dropped like flies after that. For two years, their employers ferociously denied any connection between the girls' deaths and their work. Even when their commission study concluded the girls had died from their pain, they did multiple more studies until one gave them the answer they wanted. So the public continued to assume radium was safe in their beauty products and in their food. In 1925, Harrison Martland's test proved conclusively radium had poisoned the watch painters by destroying their bodies from the inside. In 1927, attorney Raymond Barry agreed to accept this case, but many of the watch painters had just months to live and were forced to accept an out of court settlement. Still, their experiences made the issue of radium safety front page story across the world. So even if the United States Radium Corp denied its role and women continued to get sick and die for 11 Seven more years, it wasn't until 1938 when a dying radium worker named Catherine DeWolf Donahue successfully sued Radium Dial Co. over her illness and that issue was settled. Number 10, spinning. Two words, chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like brownie green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cupsidors lined the bar. Most of the time, 
They missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually because, no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my god, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France. Worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up, perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. Ah, <laughs> though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably. I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist, and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together, we still do it in like water parks, we swim in pools of pee pee, and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, it's so great, you're like, why did you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so. Boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. Number five, 
dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently, but why are we even doing it? Do we know, other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth the first apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short-lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you have to go back on it so you look hot. I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine. I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick you ask? Radiation, they didn't know this yet, it was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal heavy thing, just face to face, now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what, at least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows? Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really, great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches. The early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, you feel us? I don't want to be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also, because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. 
Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course. That was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Whew, here we go. Nowadays you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal, Seashells. And when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and, you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells. Can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clam shells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember, when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay. In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no, like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw, okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin, long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse. 
back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm gonna stick to the spearmint. Spearmint, Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again. Who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one is, hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting, I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign, but a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <sighs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? <laughs> well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are massive excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well, just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. 
Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault, a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of more about personal hygiene now than we did you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys. It's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's, that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth, but this, that it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst, you gotta get up, walk down that long scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up, oh, oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes, if you're feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history. You're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing, unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health and so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun-kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status, but simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. 
Empire. A well known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters, so she put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth, and yes, yeah, slowly you understand. Number seven, Victorian Laundry Day. You spilled some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when Laundry Day came around, it was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry. Hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe, and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also cover the wigs in powdered, scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later, his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn, but the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. And yeah. Number five. Urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day, and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes, and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dipped, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee. This is so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was just, it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years, the bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, it was just not, it was like basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's meal times, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a shit. I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be. Just jump. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. 
you would get pretty close to the king. I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. You know, you have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair and perform other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I have no I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction, obviously today, horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls. But where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Beautiful. Setting our list off at number 10, short teeth. Ooh, this one hurts right off the bat. The Renaissance period saw a a, a trend, a fun trend, that makes me cringe. I had to start off with it and then I'll recover and we'll move on. Women during this era were categorized by features like wide hips, a narrow waist, long legs, all the craziest restrictive clothing you can imagine, they had it. However, there were also peculiar notions of beauty that emerged from this time. Short teeth, yeah, little teeth, file them down. It was believed that the smaller the teeth in length, the more attractive they were considered. As a result, individuals would go to extreme length to achieve this desired look. Again, back in this era, era, it wasn't done in the best, most ideal way, I guess you could say. Teeth were sometimes filed down to reduce their size, aiming to create the impression of dainty and delicate teeth. Delicate now that you shaved off all the enamel. Number nine, medieval tights. I'm actually wearing a pair right now. You just can't see, haha. -ha. During the middle ages, men would wear tights. Now this was associated with practicality and functionality rather than fashion. Although I'm sure some of these noble lords absolutely cooked wearing these tights, you know? They're like Link from Zelda, they're great out there. I'm sure some of these guys invented fashion, that's all I'm saying. Sir Lulu of House Lemons. I'm like, oh, these are great. <laughs> Tights were an essential garment for both men and women alike. They provided warmth, protection, and ease of movement, of course, particularly for those engaged in physical activities such as horseback riding and combat, or doing top 10 lists for YouTube. It's also a pretty good one. Tights were typically made from wool or linen, and they covered the legs from the waist to the feet. Of course, they were worn underneath other garments like tunics and doublets, and as the Middle Ages progressed, tights began to be made from silk, and more decorative elements were soon added, reflecting a blend of practicality, but now, for sure fashion. Now we definitely have a lick of fashion in those Spanx. They also reserved a symbol of status and wealth, as of course, only the affluent could afford such a fancy pair of tights. Yeah, imagine that, tights are fancy. Number eight. Ancient Greek unibrow. I love this one. This is so good. I might bring this back. Ancient Greek dudes, I'll start by saying they did not around. You're pretty fit, pretty jacked. Wouldn't want to fight any of them at any time. That being said, this one's kind of funny. In ancient Greek culture, a unibrow was considered a desirable trait and was connected with beauty and intelligence. The unibrow was believed to be a sign of strong character and an indication of a person's high intellectual and moral qualities. It was even imitated by those who did not naturally have a unibrow. How fun, they would just lie to you, that's great. The ancient Greeks valued symmetry and harmony in physical appearance, and the unibrow was considered to enhance the balance and attractiveness 
of your face. Damn, maybe I should stop shaving my unibrow right there. Time for my intellectual properties to rise up. Number seven, you're so vain. During the 17th century in Great Britain, the wealthy and aristocratic, they embraced an extreme trend of pale skin. A lot of pale dudes. They also adopted plunging necklines to partially expose their um, chest area as a fashionable statement. Victorian cleavage, what an invention, we love that. The combination of a pale complexion and exposed clothing symbolized affluence and the ability to avoid sun exposure. Unlike peasants, you know, who actually see the sun day in, day out. God forbid you caught a UV ray and you were also a royal. Mm, don't like that. Most women achieved this paleness by using an artificial powder, and then it got a little more specific. Then women began drawing blue veins on their, um, you know, all down their stuff here. Literally, they would take blue paint and just draw these very faint paint lines. Just faint streaks of blue. Now it's interesting to see where we're at now with beauty trends and paint and stuff. Today it's way more complicated than a few veins running down your neck. Today we have the show Sexy Beasts. That's a lot of work up here up top. That's a lot of blue paint, that's all I'm saying. Number six, elongated skulls. Turning the clocks way back for this one, the practice of elongating skulls among the Maya civilization is a fascinating cultural phenomenon. Now, I wouldn't call this a beauty trend by any means, not at all, but I had to include it in this list because, well, when else can I talk about it? The practice held significant cultural and societal significance for the Mayan people, representing social status, beauty ideals, or even spiritual beliefs. That's our best guess. I mean, that's our best guess. Today, we really don't know. It was so long ago. Elongated skulls were achieved through the application of binding techniques such as tightly wrapping cloth or using wooden boards to shape the skull during growth and development stages. While the precise reasons for this practice still remain a speculation, it reflects the rich cultural diversity and unique practices of ancient Maya civilizations. And then we got to unibrows. You know what I mean? Where have we gone? Number five, custom corsets. In the 19th century, the hourglass shape was considered the ideal shape of a woman's body. Of course. Course. That's so natural looking. Love that. And the narrower the waist was, the more beautiful this lady was considered. So in an attempt to stand out from others, women would tighten their corsets impossibly tight, more and more so that their waist could literally be wrapped with two palms. Yeah, so much so their internal organs were actually compressed. Horrible, and that fast blood flow was now blocked. Corsets were made from various materials, including whalebone and steel. steel steel, that's horrible, and they're often heavily boned for support. While corsets did provide an appearance of elegance, they also have subjected women to discomfort and restricted movement, which is not great. We don't love that. We don't love standing still, not being able to breathe. Over time, concerns about health and restrictive nature of corsets, this grew, leading to the emergence of reform movements, advocating for more comfortable and less constricting undergarments. Like, please, I can't breathe. Can you please? I'm trying to go to a ball. Number four, Renaissance forehead. Four, forehead, you see what I did there. During the Renaissance era, high curved foreheads were considered a beauty ideal for both men and women alike. Now this aesthetic preference came from the belief that a high and pronounced forehead was a sign of intelligence, wisdom, and refinement. It's not, it's really not. You look stressed out more than anything. It was associated with classical beauty and the idolized proportions found in ancient Greek and Roman sculptures. I saw a bunch of bald statues and they're like, Oh, that could be me. I could look just like that guy. Hopefully not entirely, but up top. To achieve this look, individuals would pluck or shave their hairline quite the ways back to create the appearance of a higher forehead. They would purposely give themselves a Coach Hines, all in the name of fashion, all in the name of beauty. We love that. Number three black teeth. During the Kian period in Japan from 794 to 1185, the tradition of ohagiro or teeth blackening was widely practiced and considered a symbol of beauty and maturity. Blacken out your teeth. There we go. The process involved using a solution made with iron fillings, vinegar tea, and rice wine. When applied to the teeth, it created a blackened effect. Now, while the staining was not permanent, the smell of the mixture was quite unpleasant. Now, despite this, ohagiro remained popular for centuries and was embraced by both men and women as a fashion statement and also as a cultural marker of age and status in Japanese society. Today we have, it's kind of coming back. I don't know, we have influencers with charcoal toothpaste. A little bit different, but this trend, it's on its way back. I can feel it, I can feel the blackened teeth coming back into fashion. Number two. The pale look. Hi, hello, there he is. We talked about the Victorian era and the veins. That's one way to achieve a pale look. But Queen Elizabeth I, she made another method. Pretty historical, pretty eye-opening. Queen Elizabeth was known to practice bloodletting as a part of her beauty routine. Bloodletting was a common medical practice during that era. It was believed to balance the body's humors and improve health. By, by dishing out blood, you can improve your health. You like that. However, Queen Elizabeth, she embraced bloodletting not solely for medical reasons, but also as a means 
means to enhance her complexion. Yeah, it was believed that by removing a small amount of blood, this would give her skin a radiant and youthful appearance. Yeah, it's nice. It really gives you that I'm about to faint look. That's great. Every painting of hers is like this, just half in, half out. This practice exemplified the extreme measures taken by individuals back then and the lengths that even royalty would go, all in their pursuit of being beautiful during the Renaissance period. No forehead, no eyebrows, no blood, apparently. What's going on? And finally, number one. Gladiator sweat. Ah, uh, yes, ancient times will end here. In ancient times, the sweat of gladiators was believed to possess medicinal and even magical properties. Yeah, abracadabra, this guy's gonna take his head off. Some individuals would collect the sweat of gladiators and apply it to their skin as a beauty treatment which is pretty yucky. They believed that it could improve complexion and again, youthfulness. Just a guy's sweat rubbing on your lips. You're like, hope I get young again, fingers crossed. This practice stemmed from the belief that in transference of strength and courage through physical contact, which I don't think that's a thing. Scientifically, hasn't been confirmed. These gladiators were completely bald also. Considering the times, gladiators also practiced shaving their entire bodies, which helped reduce the risk of lice and made wounds easier to clean. Yeah, we'll end on naked, bald gladiators. Why not? In 10th place, we have crocodile dung baths. When I picture taking a bath, I'm picturing my like off-white tub, a generous handful of Epsom salts, and maybe like a lush bath fizz if I'm feeling really fancy. But also not always, because cleaning the tub after that is a chore in itself, and I'm normally only taking a bath instead of a shower if I'm really exhausted. So, right now. <laughs> Many different animal products and byproducts have been claimed to work wonders on the skin, but this one might be up there with the grossest. In ancient times, the Greeks and Romans used a special ingredient in their body toning mud baths, crocodile excrement. Full body bathtubs were filled with a mixture of earth and freshly harvested uh, feces, which was also used to make anti-aging face masks. They believed the reptile poop would uh, dramatically slow down the aging process. I'm terrified of the creatures as a self-preservation rule, and this is definitely a something that made me want to hurl. Look, all I knew before today about crocodiles, other than just how scary they are, is that they shared the osteoderm trait with dinosaurs, and I'd like to go back to just knowing that. Thanks! In ninth place, we have pearl powder in China. So some historians and beauticians suggested that the concubine turned empress dowager Cixi, who ruled for 47 years in the 19th century, popularized Chinese pearl powder for its beauty benefits, since she was widely recognized for her leadership as well as her beauty. The pearl powder is rubbed onto the face and is said to promote brightening, exfoliation, and anti-wrinkling. Many of these pearls are cultivated along China's river basin in the Shanghai area and are ground into a powder to be used in beauty treatments. After three to four years of cultivation, oysters grow to about 10 inches long and are harvested by fishermen. Now apparently this routine is still used in today's society and I'd love to know in the comments if that's true or not. In 8th place we have how to stay pale. I'm thankful my pale complexion is all natural and while I've been tempted a couple of times in my life to maybe tan it, I managed to avoid temptation. Last summer was probably the most I've considered tanning, only because I was getting horrid sunburns from my day job at the time and you know, considered evening them out for other work purposes. Not that having tan skin is a bad thing by any means, but I'm perfectly content being a snow white knockoff. By the time Elizabeth I sat on the English throne, Throne, her subjects associated color in the skin with those who engaged in backbreaking labor outdoors. The whiter the skin, the richer you could appear. Since human beings naturally have a bit of color, the beauty treatment back then was to apply a powder made of white lead, calcium carbonate, and hydroxide to every inch of exposed flesh you know, poison in a bowl. That powder introduced toxins over time that caused various side effects, including skin inflammation and baldness, leading to a couple of different wig trends, which I promise I will touch on. To further emphasize the pale skin, by the late 1800s, some women would use a blue or violet pencil to trace their veins to make their skin appear paler. Hey, I've used liquid latex and eyeliner for a lot worse, so I can't really judge that part at all. In less lethal methods though, some ladies created a toner out of strawberries and wine and slathered it on their skin to help keep their porcelain complexion, and now that's something I'd try. Hey, I've heard a lot about the health benefits of wine, and I'm not opposed to experimenting. In seventh place, we have arsenic. So to achieve that very trendy near-death look in Edwardian times, women would swallow arsenic in small portions to keep them super skinny and supposedly attractive. Heck, even Sears sold arsenic wafers for convenience. Deadly diseases were just that popular, and some folks even caught tuberculosis just for the beauty aspects, which my brain hurts saying that, not gonna lie. Arsenic invaded almost every aspect of life in 19th century Britain, leaving a toll of death and illness. But most of the fatalities from arsenic were more pedestrian. From accidental use in food or from exposure to compounds in consumer goods such as fabric dyes and wallpapers in facilities that meet these products and in the polluted air. Now, Victorians were just as obsessed with their bodies as we are, if not more dangerously, if you can believe that. Many women used arsenic to fight wrinkles, and men swallowed arsenic tablets as kind of a pre... Uh... Now, it's unclear if arsenic can actually be used to uh, turn compasses to the north, but I wouldn't recommend trying it. I think there's safer ways. 
In sixth place, sweat. Well, I'm not against using a highlighter to make my skin dewy and glowing. I'm not talking about a natural shimmer today. Heck, I'm not even talking about practices similar to like WWE, where they're constantly spraying water on their faces and bodies to appear gleaming before they even walk down a ramp. Gladiator sweat was something that used to be used to make women's complexions glow. The sweat of great gladiator men was collected just so that it could be mixed in facial masks and other beauty products. And I think my skin broke out reading that. I'm glad we as a society know better now, with the knowledge that, you know, sweat clogs the heck out of one's pores. In fifth place, we have urine mouthwash. Okay, so this is tied with a dung bath on the top things that are gonna make Alexa puke today. Teeth are a vital part of your overall beauty, but before the invention of modern dental technology, it was tricky to keep them clean and bright. The ancient Romans believed that they had the solution, and that solution was urine. The ammonia in urine is actually good for disinfection, and it continued to be used as an active ingredient in mouthwash until at least the 18th century. I did know about ammonia for disinfection before today, since I believe it's a survival tactic used to disinfect poison and venom from wounds if need be, but having that in my mouth is not for me. No thanks. In fourth place, we have the tapeworm diet. So beauty starts from the inside out, and maintaining a trim and slim figure was pretty prized in England during the 1800s. One particularly disgusting beauty regimen that gained some traction was the tapeworm diet, where people looking to shed pounds would swallow pills containing sanitized tapeworm larvae, which would take up residence uh, in your stomach. The worms would divert your excess calories to their own bodies and grow larger and larger until you had them removed. Thankfully, this particular diet fell out of fashion pretty quickly, minus a resurgence in the 90s. I've heard about this and accidentally Swallowing a tapeworm is up there on my list of irrational fears. Also, does anyone remember the Mr. Meaty tapeworm episode? I only watched it for the first time recently, and oh my goodness, did it ever scar my brain. Granted, that show as a whole is nightmare inducing. In third place, we have fire treatment. A trend that swept China is called Huo Liao, which translates to fire treatment. So a towel soaked with alcohol and medicinal herbs is placed on the face or other body parts that need toning and tightening, and then lit on fire for several seconds. Now, allegedly, this invigorates the skin and helps to reduce sagging and wrinkles. It's relatively safe since apparently the flame doesn't burn long enough to cause serious damage. So I have some friends who do sideshow performing and do quite a few fire fun things. So maybe this is how they stay looking so attractive? Consider my mind boggled by this concept. Like, is Botox out of fashion or something? I haven't had any work done personally, but this just scares the bejeebus out of me. In second place, we have Wig Lord. See, I promised I'd get back to talking about wigs. Big hair has been a symbol of beauty throughout the ages, but most ladies in the Middle Ages didn't get the kind of nutrition necessary to really grow and style luxurious locks, so they fit Baked it with wigs. Kinda like I do today. I got a lot of wigs. The trend of looking and being ill would cause the hair to fall out pretty easily, and these giant hair pieces weren't all too sanitary. Victorian wigs were constructed out of wooden frames that had hair draped over and that was glued on with pastes of bear grease and beef lard. That tasty mixture was irresistible to rats, who would often nest inside hair pieces while they were not worn until wig cages were invented to keep them safe while the wigger was sleeping. So I definitely dabble in wig styling myself as a cosplayer, but the worst I've ever done to a wig was use hot glue before I knew better. Also, rats, no thank you. I recently found a mouse in my place and freaked the heck out. Wigs are definitely still built using wooden frames when need be, but got to be is more the adhesive of choice these days. Which reminds me, I've got a Barbie wig I need to style tonight. In our first place, we have Geisha Makeup and Remover. So I'm personally a fan of the Neutrogena makeup wipes, but those didn't always exist in history. According to about.com, Geishas would use the dung of nightingales to remove their very thickly applied makeup at the end of the day. And when I say thickly applied, I mean their makeup is caked on. So I guess this is how Mulan, she must have had it on her sleeve. <laughs> the first step is to apply Binsuke, which is a type of wax that acts as a barrier between the skin and the cosmetics, so the primer of the face. Then there's Oshiroi, the white face powder, which was made up of lead, zinc, and seashells. You know, crunchy and lethal. Benai is used on the eyes, lips, and brows, and is a crimson powder made from the crushed safflower petals. Benai is not used all over the lips by the geishas, but rather to create a flower bud effect. And Mako is used strictly for the lower lip. That red I mentioned before is also used to sculpt the outside corner of the eye and to create a subtle pink contour on the cheeks and nose. To achieve a delicate effect, the eyebrows are painted crimson and then black with charcoal. Some folks also shave their brows to make it easier to apply makeup. So I see where drag queens got the idea. The hair would be brushed with wax to keep it in place. And thanks to guanine, which is a natural cleanser for the skin and contains bird poop, it apparently makes a great makeup remover as well as a purifying facial mask. The Daily Mail reported that Tom Cruise rubs a mixture of nightingale poop, rice bran, and water on his skin on a regular basis to keep his youthful look. And while I'll admit the guy does look good for his age, I'm not exactly about to take beauty tips from a rich Scientologist. The only thing we will ever have in common is a love of popcorn and the inability to answer a question if we aren't prepped. And that brings us to the end of our time, and I'm torn between being impressed and wanting to hurl. Let me know in the comments what y'all thought of today, and feel free to leave us a like, subscribe, and why not just hit the bell as well? Number 10, Golden Hair. 
Hair is important. Imagine how different George Clooney would look if he was balding. Ooh. You gotta take care of your hair. There's nothing like treating your scalp to a nice scented and moisturizing shampoo. The Incas thought this too. And reach for the next best thing. Fermented pee. Oh yes, that's right. Basically, you take a pot, you put some wee in it, and let it sit for a week. Why not? Want to stay smelling fresh, of course. I'm not sure if this would make your hair silky smooth, as I'm not frankly in the market to try this. And this one, I can firmly say that if you try this one at home, stop it. Get some help. Don't do that. We belong in the toilet, not on top of your head. Stop. Number nine, what a crock. As if urine in the hair wasn't enough, this beauty trend comes at you from the Romans and the Greeks. The Romans and the Greeks were the peak of ancient civilizations, built beautiful monuments, and were honestly just so smart, so smart. So smart that when they saw crocodile dung, they knew right away it had some beauty properties that they just couldn't pass up. They would bathe in crocodile dung. That's right, bathe in crocodile dung. Known for its restorative and anti-aging properties, I'm just not sure how this works really. Did they like heat it up or something or did this like slip into a tub with a pile of like lukewarm unlawfulness? And how do they really know it had de-aging properties? I'm starting to think this knowledge might be related to the whole urine shampoo thing. This is also gonna be a hard pass for me, no thanks, I'm, I'm good, no, no, no poo in the hair. Number eight. Beauty is pain. Ladies, we all know sometimes beauty is pain. It can be a lot or even too much sometimes, but how far are you willing to go for a little extra beauty? In ye olde times, pale skin was considered to be beautiful, but not always the easiest to obtain. Makeup is expensive and was made of lead and other lovely materials. With all that makeup being caked on, that had to feel lovely on your face. So what's the next best thing? Bloodletting, yes, that's right. In order to have that healthy twilight pale look, women found themselves relieving themselves of their blood. Bloodletting was used for other medical reasons at the time as well, but why not get two birds stoned at once? Stay healthy and achieve that beautiful complexion. I unfortunately pass out at the sight of someone else's blood, so the loss of my own just to be pale would not, would not bode well for me. I will have to hard pass on this trend as well. Plus, look at these rosy cheeks. I don't want to lose that. I think it makes me look cute. Number seven, mice flavored toothpaste. It's ancient Egypt. Life is great. You got the pyramids. You got the Nile River. And you got some guy who claims to be a doctor and he's pulling out the brains of your last king through his nose so he can be mummified for the afterlife. That's just awesome. Just another day under Ra's warm sand. Egyptians just knew how to live and they knew dental hygiene was important. So they came up with toothpaste. Sore tooth? Try this toothpaste. What was this toothpaste made of, you ask? Well, it was made of crushed mice, of course. Ugh, oh, God. I mean, here I am thinking that just some herbs crushed up with some water would be fine to eliminate bad breath, but after all, having nice teeth and nice breath is sexy. So, the Egyptians took some mice and they crushed them up with other ingredients in what must have been the most foul and rancid concoction this side of the Nile River. Just go ahead, put that goop in your mouth. You'll look okay, you'll look great after. Oh, just brush it on there, smells great. Oh, that's amazing. Number six, pearly blacks. Here's another beauty trend brought to you by the horrifying things we as human beings can do to a mouth. In Japan, there's a practice called ohaguro, which just translates to blackening of teeth. Japanese women would essentially, over time, dye their teeth black. Another dual purpose, as it was thought to preserve teeth in old age, and was seen as a sign of beauty. Something that separates humans from beasts, or so they thought. The dye itself was similar to some inks, as the process involved dissolving iron, vinegar, and some oils. After this process, a concoction is made that is a non-water soluble and acts like a dye when applied to the teeth. Yet again, as a semi-charming internet host, I am going to pass on this opportunity. Plus, who am I to judge? Japan has given us lots of fun stuff, lots of great stuff. They're awesome. Mario, Zelda, Little Mac. Basically, I'm a Nintendo nerd, so I can never speak ill of the land of my favorite games. Even if the whole black teeth thing only ended like 150 years ago, which, when you think about it, isn't that long ago. Number five, rationing legs. 
World War II was a war fought everywhere, and that includes at home. Go ahead and ask your grandparents what it was like. It was only a nickel for a bus ticket, and the movies had newsreels, yes. It's three o'clock and I'm ready for dinner. See, that's what they say. Go ahead and ask them, they'll tell you. Well, okay, Grandma. But on a serious note, people had to ration food for the war effort. They also had to ration other goods that you might not expect, like ladies' nylon stockings. In Britain, nylon stockings were all the rage, but the materials for such were needed for the war effort. So the Gravy Browning Company came up with a bright idea, just paint your stockings on. Some women actually did this, and sometimes would even draw on the seam with an eyebrow pencil just to make it look like the real thing. Ooh. However, I just cannot see this being a great idea. I mean, it rains a lot in Britain. Would it not just wash off? What if I get sweaty running for my bus because I'm late for work? Yup, this is another one I'm just gonna have to pass up on. I'm sure the pain was 100% safe for body application as well. It probably wasn't. Number four, bad hair days. All right, this one is generalizing, but hear me out. When was the last time you thought about haircuts in the past? Yeah, see, you don't. That's because they belong in the past. I'm talking about popular hairstyles from the 1950s to 2000s because honestly, there was a lot of them. And honestly, what were we thinking? We are a species that has left our own planet through science and technology. Yet, we come up with hairstyles like the beehive, the mullet, everything in the 1980s, and the most heinous, atrocious hairstyle ever, frosted tips. Sorry, Guy Fieri. The list goes on, but my point is people fully went out in public with these crazy hairstyles. I, myself, may or may not have sinned and maybe had frosted tips at one point in my life. I maybe had a button up shirt with a blue hot rod flames on it. But I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you the complete truth. After being a part of this trend, I can firmly say I no longer want to participate in any more bad hair days or blue flamed shirts. Number three, you do what with my wee? Back to the Romans again, and back to the pee. At least the Incas were keeping it outside the body. I, I guess Romans wanted a clean mouth and there wasn't any minty fresh mouthwash to reach for. So what do you use? We. Lots of we, specifically Portuguese we. It was just the most sought after. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I feel like there was more wine drinking than water drinking in Rome, more than people would like to admit it. So, if that is the byproduct of all that wine drinking and you're giving that a swish in your mouth, well, all I can say is I'm just gonna give that a big pass on playing spin the bottle. Number two, my little weight loss friend. Okay, I get it. It makes perfect sense. The numbers add up here. But all I'm gonna say is, the chief knows medicine and he said this is a hard pass for me and it ain't it. If you want to shed that extra winter weight and be beach body ready with minimal effort and still enjoy deep fried chocolate bars, then you have only one thing to do and that is swallow tapeworms. Where a tapeworm will grow inside your body and help eat those unwanted calories. Trouble is you can get very sick and if the tapeworm attaches itself to something that is, well, vital for your living, you're going to have a bad time. You'll get sick. Just don't do this one, please. Don't swallow tapeworms, please. Don't do it. Number one, I spy some great complexion. Arsenic cookies. I'm just gonna be blunt with this one. Women were eating arsenic cookies for their complexion. You could straight up just walk into a Sears in 1902 and just buy some. It says it's safe on the box. For people who aren't familiar with arsenic, it's poison. Spies often carry one in pill form to unalive themselves in case of capture. At this time in history, it was no secret what arsenic was. This is just kind of weird, like putting ketchup on your eggs, kind of weird. That's just a joke. We're having a debate here in the office and I'm just curious to see who does that. But back to the poison. It was not safe and over time, with lots of exposure, you can get very sick. It's arsenic, it's poison. Don't do that one either. Why, that's just wrong. Number 10, face off. All right, so it's the 1900s, and technology has gotten good since the 1800s. That means a better life for everyone to enjoy. One such advancement was in women's cosmetics. Introducing the Radia, a brand of makeup that's formulated to make you glow, ladies. And if you don't glow, you can't shine. The secret ingredient, radioactive materials. I honestly can't believe that this one is real, but yep, here I am. Yes, their makeup products contain concentrations of radioactive material to give you the facial boost that you need. Tighten the skin, get rid of wrinkles, and literally make you glow. I'm not a doctor, and you probably aren't one either, but 
I don't think I have to tell you that applying nuclear material to your face every day before work is not a great idea. In fact, it might be a speedrunning strategy to see how fast you can end up in a hospital for radioactive sickness. I read a report from the chief who's a nuclear scientist and he said that's not it. Number 9. Nail Biter There's a short amount of time on the clock. The scores are tied and your favorite team's player steps up to the pitch, plate or wherever they need to be. Beer sweats begin to drip down your face onto a jersey that should have been thrown out two playoffs ago. The nachos and chicken wings that were once plentiful on your coffee table now lay barren with emptiness. This is what most sports fans would call a nail biter. But all Super Bowl predictions aside, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in ye olde times, trimming their nails. How else but with the set of pearl chompers the Lord hath given you. That's just how people did it. Yes, that's right, they bit their nails off. Which even today is kind of gross. You gotta use the old noggin for a minute and think about how clean people's hands were. No running water, no modern toilet paper. Ooh, stinky. That is not a win win situation. That is, that's actually a lose lose situation. Don't do that. That's gross. Number eight, mini brows. Back in ye olde times, pale skin was in, and so was dark eyebrows. How to achieve such a complexion? Well, bloodletting for the skin, but I've gone over that before. Something a little more heinous was committed to make ladies' eyebrows look luscious. Mice, a lady's best friend, right? Yeah. Besides some French rouge and ivory teeth, a common beauty practice was to have mouse furs as eyebrows. This is just wrong on so many levels. Mice are just gross as it is on a regular basis without them being on your face. But my question is, was there like a mouse hunter or like, was there a mouse farm? Or was the buddy just scooping up mice out of the gutters and skinning them and then, uh, here you go your highness, here's some fresh mice skins. Ooh, yuck, man, no. Number seven, pucker up. Hey, on this channel, we've talked about some crazy stuff in history, and a lot of crazy stuff unfortunately had a lot to do with women being hugely mistreated in the past. However, some women acted against this. I'd give specific reasons for wanting to get back to the patriarchy, but I'd be here all day. One woman came up with a devious plan, a way to remove the stinky men from her life and to get away with it too. Introducing Aqua Tofana. It was an odorless, colorless poison that was slow acting and would resemble side effects of a sickness, or at least a common sickness at the time. It was marketed as a cosmetic. Women could wear this on their cheek and when the big hunk of a man came in for a kiss, well, it was probably one of the last things he would ever do. The main ingredients were arsenic and nightshade, which, if you didn't know, is very poisonous. Next time you forget to take the trash out at night, gentlemen, just take notice of when the wife wants to give you a kiss. It could be your last. Number six, boots with the fur. Most of you probably love a good pair of apple bottom jeans and some boots with the fur. But for our Silver Fox audience, they may remember a pair of denim that was more sinister. Bell bottom jeans. Yes, that's right. These pants were wild to say the least. While its origins may be rooted in the Navy and sailors, their rise to fame was during the 60s and the white powder fueled 70s. Remember disco? I know, right? High platform shoes, bell bottoms, and leisure suits. Although I can't lie, I feel like I look pretty good in a leisure suit. Just saying, I don't know. This is just one of those beauty trends that we thought looked good, but in reality looked really strange. I'm sure that'll never happen again though. Not like the trends and fads that we had today will ever go out of style. We'll all be looking back and laughing at the silly things we wore, right? <laughs> oh man, I gotta clean up my closet. Are we still gonna be doing Fortnite dances then? I don't know, we'll see. Number five, a whole lot of man. Well folks, I haven't done much traveling in my time, but it looks like I know where I'm headed next. To the body tribes of Ethiopia. Where, ladies and gentlemen, it's men of my proportions that are most attractive. <laughs> the men of the Bodhi tribe participate in beauty pageants of sorts where the winner is declared a hero and every girl in the village wants to be with the rotund hero. The men isolate themselves away for months at a time with no physical activity. Honestly, for a World of Warcraft player, isn't that hard? Where the men consume a diet that's high in fat to, well, make them fat. What's on the menu? I'm so glad you asked. Well, since the Bodhi tribe has such a great grasp on agriculture, the men drink cow's milk mixed with blood. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. After enough consuming of the milkshake from hell, the men's stomachs get fat and the gawking commences. I'm more than just a cut of meat, ladies. 
You can't just treat me that way. Number four, Shark Girls. All right, when I was researching this one, I could barely even look at the footage. I was literally cringing in my chair. And this is coming from a guy who likes the Star Wars prequels. Yeah, I know. There are certain women of tribes around the world who have teeth like Jaws that are considered beautiful. And I mean the shark, not the James Bond villain. The process of sharpening teeth is quite... Uh, well, interesting to say the least, as it's performed by dentists, and I would hardly call them dentists, as they use rocks and chisels to acquire this acquired look. Did I mention there's no anesthesia for this cosmetic surgery? All jokes aside, this is just a lot, and I actually get lightheaded just thinking about it. We gotta move on to the next point before I lose my lunch, or I pass out. Uh. Number three, the George Costanza. Today, every girl wants those long, luscious locks. No split ends with healthy hair and just a radiant glow. But women in ye olde Europe were after the chrome dome kind of look, if you know what I'm saying. They had their hair pulled back, revealing a large portion of their forehead. Hey, look, ladies, not that there's anything wrong with balding. It happens. I'd be very ignorant to say that it might happen to me too. It could. When I get old, it'll probably happen. I actually know a guy who's balding right now. Shout out to him. It's just strange how something that could be considered not beautiful today was all the rage back then. Queens literally sat down on their chairs and said, Give me the George Costanza look, please. I'm feeling like a real winner today, Jerry. Number two, burn it off. In ye olde times, medicine wasn't great. That's no secret. And sometimes these trendy medical practices crossed over into beauty. What do I mean by that? Well, nobody's perfect, right? We've all got bumps, bruises, blemishes, zits, pimples, scars, moles, spots, freckles, skin tags, eye bags, boils, bunions, warts, dark spots, and some emotional damage that a therapist or a bottle of vodka could not fix. However, when people in the yieldy times needed to remove any of the list I just mentioned, besides the internal suffering that is chronic depression and anxiety, they use hot pokers. No, that's not medicine, but rather the same kind of hot poker that you put in a fire. They were used to burn whatever it was that, well, needed to be burned off. Yes, burned off. While still a medical practice, imagine how beautiful you would feel after your least favorite spot got burned off in excruciating pain and probably causing an infection. Are you ready? Here it comes. I'm going to do it twice in this list, but I'll let you guys finish it. Are you ready? I spoke to the chief and he said... It's not it! There you go. Ah, hey, you said it! Let's go. Number one, glowing teeth. Teeth are important, and this is a reminder that you should go to the dentist, stop putting it off, seriously. Healthy mouth is gorgeous for everyone. So that's why you'd want to use Doramand, a radioactive toothpaste. A what? Yes, a radioactive toothpaste, coming full circle with the radiation today. This stuff was what it said on the box. And this one literally did say it on the box, it was radioactive toothpaste. Like that was something to brag about or something. I don't need to tell you why that's wrong, or unhealthy. You may as well just sit in a room and leave an x-ray machine on all day at that rate. Only minty fresh toothpaste for me, please. At number 10, painting veins. Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall, and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive, I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dresses with plunging necklines to show off the girls, and they painted themselves white using a powder. Frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white, so to solve this, they came up with a new beauty trend, drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this, because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible, and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. At number nine, tiny teeth. During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah. Teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know. 
because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the belle of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, nails for days. These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails, though, isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years, like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you could imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever wanna have nails that long? <laughs> At number seven, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. At number six, tiny tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was five or six years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. At number five, long skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times, at least, was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. Hi, number four. 
five head. Let's go back to the renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the renaissance, it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful, but obviously not everyone can be built like that. As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desired, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said, receding hairline, but make it fashion. Suppose. At number three, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. Because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that, and you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. At number two, strange corsets. Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waists. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, corsets evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no-no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, I have my ears pierced and obviously my nose is pierced, but there are so many other places that you can get pierced even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants more comfortable. This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. But remember, in the wise words of Beyonce, pretty hurts. Oh boy, was she right. Number 10, liquid stockings. When most people think of war, they think of side A versus side B. Man with gun shoot other man with gun. Simple, right? To most, yes. But the war departments and those behind the scenes know that the war is a logistical nightmare. Seriously. A lot of things on this list are because we needed to find alternatives. Millions of resources were pooled together to defeat the tyranny of fascism in World War II. Besides guns and ammunition, obviously, literally everything else is needed. Rubber, cloth, fabric, food, water, oil, grease, medicine, gas, men, and all kinds of metals. One of the things that was needed for the war effort was nylon, the same thing your grandma used for her stockings. So in Britain, when there was a shortage, the ladies did the next best thing and used a liquid to paint on their stockings. A classic example of keeping calm and carrying on. Way to go, ladies. Should be a bad idea though. If I started sweating on those, I'd have paint everywhere. It'd be really, it wouldn't be good, dude. It would not be good. Number nine, food rations. I know, but listen, you just aren't you when you're hungry. Nobody can tell me that they feel pretty on an empty stomach. Am I right? Maybe less bloated, but still, you're not your best. Sadly for people living at home during the war, food rationing was quite common. Meats, grains, dairy, pretty much everything was needed to feed the troops. My grandparents always tell the story of them growing up during the war and that they would trade in tins of grease collected at home for free entry to the movie theater, which kind of makes sense. Which if you ask someone from that time is a big deal. 
The grease had multiple uses in the military. There's lots of uses for it. There's grease, guns, you need grease. You need, you need, you need the grease. Anyway. Number eight, Rivet Rosie. Every lady out there right now, young and old, has different fits. I just wear what's clean and what makes me look like a stereotypical Canadian. I do a lot of plaid, that's just how it goes. When you get to the club, that's a different fit from the one you wear from going to work, right? Well, despite the glamour and the chicness of 1940s in Hollywood, a lot of ladies had to go to work. Men were at war. You gotta, you gotta, fill, gotta fill the quotas, gotta fill it. Can't exactly show up to the bomb factory in a tight dress and heels for a long day's work, now can you? No, wouldn't be comfortable. Number seven, red for victory. Mustache man hated red lipstick. Yeah, I didn't know that either. But when a scary dictator man says no lipstick, that means no red lipstick. Whew, don't wanna cross him. The Western allies took this to their advantage. Marketing for this got a huge boost, as wearing the cosmetics that the angry German man didn't want you to was thought to be contributing to the war effort, and honestly, it was. This is also impartial to inventing pinup girls, or at least the whole culture for them. The ladies all dolled up to stick it to the man in the eagle's nest and gave the boys overseas something worth fighting for. That's right, ladies, show them what they're fighting for. Number six, close shave. This one goes out to all the guys out there that sucked at shaving the first couple times they had to do it. I'm just one of them. Heck, who am I kidding? I'm still pretty bad at it. Maybe you shaved too close and accidentally cut yourself. Shaved against the grain, or maybe you missed a couple hairs. That, that always happens to me. Keeping yourself groomed in the military is important. Ask any drill sergeant, they'll tell you. But can you honestly imagine trying to shave in a war zone? The only thing I would want to be doing is hiding or telling jokes. I would love to tell jokes in a war, but they don't exactly have private first class j jokers, do they? N no, they don't. I wouldn't last long, but yes, shaving was a part of military life, completed with a tiny shave kit and mirror whilst under the watch of the enemy. No thank you. Number five, harmful products. Today, most folks are careful about what they put into them, but back in the day, not so much. When the war started, the military needed a lot of resources, like previously mentioned, and companies had to come up with alternatives. But when coming up with an alternative, testing may not have been done, or at least thorough. That means whatever they made could prove to be harmful to the user, like the radium girls from the First World War. Refer to my other video. My point is, this is a time when products that contain cyanide are sold on store shelves, so anything is possible Possible, which is just messed up. Watch what you're doing. Number four, good smoke. After a long day of receiving artillery and gunfire from German positions, a GI may not be looking himself, or probably doesn't feel himself either. Early stages of PTSD forming, most likely. So what can I do to improve this mood, they ask? And appearance? Why smoke a cigarette, of course, what else? Smoking culture was huge back then, and it wasn't seen by the public as a health risk. Lucky Strike cigarettes were packaged with soldiers' rations. They were given out cigarettes. It's just wild, you open up a can, there's my hand, there's my crackers. There's my smoke, so I'm good to go. Number three, nothing left. Unfortunately for a lot of cities in Europe, they got destroyed by bombing raids. Berlin in particular took a pounding. Pictures of the rubbled out city make you wonder how they ever rebuilt it. With that in mind, you can just imagine how beauty and fashion were the last thing on people's minds. Things like food, water, shelter, and fearing the sound of air raid sirens were more of a top priority. 1945 Berlin is not the place to head on down to the department store and pick out a new dress. You wear whatever you can find, and that's about it. Number two, strapped up. Bang, 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 bang. If you found yourself to be one of the lovely ladies of the French resistance, or really any resistance against the Germans during World War II, there was a good chance that you never left the house without your favorite accessory, ladies. Yes, that's right. A firearm. Across many nations in Europe, secret underground rebellions were being organized to overthrow their invaders. Allied forces even airdropped simple made firearms to resistance so they could get access to a better one with the one they dropped. It makes sense. How very James Bond of you. Oh, yes. <sighs> Behave. Number one, clean nails. Keep your nails clean and short. It's something I love to do. My nails get too long, I go straight for the pair of clippers. Having clipped nails and less hair was a part of every GI's routine. Besides looking dapper in a trench, the real reason was in case of chemical weapons and any toxic residue getting caught in beards, hair, nails, just anything like that really. Would that work? I mean, sort of, but just not being exposed would be a lot better of an option. And now, we're gonna get back to some comments that you guys made before, some comments that I really like. We're gonna, we're gonna get back, we're gonna do some, some interaction with Chetty. Linda MacArthur said, my grandma is the youngest of 22 children. 
I believe it was from my Victorian uh, era video uh, when I was talking. I asked you guys how many uh, kids your grandparents, siblings they had, how many siblings your grandparents had. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely just, I told you, that's the way it goes. For some reason, that there was no, uh, there was no, I don't know if I can say birth control, but there's no birth control. There's no, you know, people just going and, and that's what happens. That's the byproduct of that. Uh, Michaela said, McDonald's is still a villain in everyone's story. No, I love McDonald's. They're the best. I hope they sponsor everything I do in life. I love McDonald's. I hope they cater my wedding. Uh, Princess Shadowstorm said, I'm not much of a gamer, but I'd love to see Chetty and Taylor battle it out in any game. Oh, Taylor, did you hear that, buddy? That sounds like a challenge, my guy. Maybe you and I should start uh, doing verses or something. Maybe a, uh, maybe a channel where we do play video games or something. That'd be kind of cool. What do you guys think about that? That's kind of a good idea. I don't know. And Curse Ravioli said, I love the name. I love that name. I came for the Chetty, and I'll stay for the content. Keep up the good work, Chetty. First of all, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. And I'm glad I'm glad you enjoy the content and I'm glad you enjoy me. If you want to see more of me, you can check out my socials down below.